Okay, so we are in the section 15.7. This is going to be 15.7a. There will be a b. 15.7a um, will definitely be multiple videos um, due to the length of the <clears throat> some of the problems and how long they take. So, as if doing two integrals wasn't enough, now we get to do three integrals all within one problem. So we're going to start talking about triple integrals. So we are going to discuss the idea of a triple integral and be able to compute them. This is difficult to conceptualize. Difficult to conceptualize. And the reason for that is <clears throat> we have a hard time thinking past three dimensions. So let me, um, let me kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. So let's think about this. If we had an integral, just a single integral, f of x dx, <clears throat> whatever that is, that is a, a graph that we could put like over here or something like that. As long as I've got bounds on this thing, like a to b, <clears throat> what we're finding with a single integral is the area beneath that curve and between the x-axis. Typically, we just say the area beneath the curve, but it is bounded by the x-axis. So we're going to say the area between um, f of x and the x-axis. And then obviously we can use a single integral to find area between two curves, not necessarily just the x-axis. But there's your concept basically with one integral. So now let's say we have our double integral, which we've just been doing. So the double integral is going to be over some kind of a domain because it's going to be projected down into the xy plane. That's your domain. The function itself will be a function of multiple variables, x and y typically, or two variables and then dA. <clears throat> it's either going to be dy dx or dx dy, depending on which way you go with that. So the concept in, again, in um, double integrals is, so now you're going to have some kind of a surface doing whatever this surface is doing, floating up there in space, and then that's going to be projected down into the xy plane and it's going to create some kind of a domain in the xy plane down there <clears throat> and what we're actually finding is the volume underneath of that surface and again we say under the surface but it's really bounded by the xy plane so we'll say that this is going to be something where we can find the volume let's say not between, let's say beneath, no, let's say between, between the surface and the xy plane. <clears throat> okay, and again, we can conceptualize that because that is, that is getting to three dimensions right there. So the question then becomes, conceptually, since I took a single integral and I ended up with area, and I took a double integral and I ended up with volume, what in the heck does a triple integral give us? And typically we say that's the triple integral over E, I'll explain E in just a second here, of a function of three variables, because if you're taking a triple integral, you're going to have to have three variables. <clears throat> And then if you notice, the d part in a single integral was just dx, that's linear. In a double integral, it's dA, that's two-dimensional. So in this case, it's going to have to be a three-dimensional change, which is going to be a dV. So it's a volume. But what does that mean? What does that actually give us? So that's where I'm going to try my best to explain this. Again, conceptually, this is not necessarily the easiest thing to understand. <clears throat> In practical application purposes, let's look at what we've got down here. So I've got this region, 
<clears throat> they're calling it B here. We're going to call this region region E. It's my three-dimensional region that I am taking this integral over. Okay, just like up here, the D part was a two-dimensional um, region that you're taking the double integral over. This is a three-dimensional region we call the region E <clears throat> that we're going to take the triple integral over. So what I want you to imagine is that each one of these little boxes or each one of these little cubes or whatever you want to call them don't have to necessarily be cubes. Um, they're going to represent some kind of crate or something in a warehouse where you've got a bunch of contents in the crate. And the idea is maybe all the contents are slightly different. So let's just, we'll actually put this in a word. So we'll say, imagine all the boxes are crates. And all these crates have different contents. So our job is going to be to find the mass of the entire warehouse. We'll say that whole thing is like a big warehouse or something like that. So our job is going to be to find the mass of the entire warehouse. So for example, this crate right up here in this corner, this piece right here, <clears throat> maybe that crate right there has a bunch of, I don't know, peanut butter. And then maybe this one down here, I'll put it in blue. Maybe the one that's represented down there, maybe that's a crate that's filled with water. Yes, it has to be some kind of a, <clears throat> a water, a liquid holding crate or something like that. Um, I don't know. And then, you know, maybe the one up in this corner, maybe that one holds the Ark of the Covenant. Little inside joke there. But again, the idea is maybe every single one of those crates holds something completely different. Maybe you've got some things which are the same, but <clears throat> obviously the amount of mass that you're going to have in each one of those little boxes is going to be completely different. So if we want to figure out what the mass is of the entire warehouse, that's the general idea of what we might be trying to do here. And this is just, this again, this is just an example. This is not the only purpose for this. Um, but the idea is within each one of these crates, and this is kind of the blown up piece over to the right. So they've taken one of these little um, <clears throat> crates out. You've got some kind of a change in Y, you've got some kind of a change in X, and you've got some kind of a change in Z. The idea is that you've got three variables, and all of them are changing. So three variables. All of them are changing, which is why you've got a delta X, a delta Y, and a delta Z. <clears throat> and that's just one specific crate. Every single one of these has some kind of a change of X, change of Y, and change of Z. All right, so let's try and put all this together. We do know that the volume of a box is defined by length times width times height. Length times width times height. Well, if we look at the box that we put up here, our length, width, and height are going to be defined by delta x, delta y, and delta z. So delta x times delta y times delta z, and it doesn't matter which order we put that in. <clears throat> well, we also know that density is defined as, well, some kind of a density function, whatever that function is, is defined to be the mass divided by the volume. It would be mass divided by the area if it's two-dimensional, but now these are three-dimensional figures, so it's the mass divided by the volume. Or, if I wanted to solve that for mass, 
I would multiply both sides times the volume. Well, we're going to change the notation. The density we were, have been using as some kind of row of x, y, z. And our um, volume we just defined as delta x, delta y, delta z. So the mass can be defined, this is the mass of a singular box, the mass can be defined by the density times the size of the box, which is really what this piece is right here. It's the amount of space that that box holds, or the volume. So you can say volume, or think of it as the amount of space of a box. <clears throat> so we find the mass by figuring out how much space does this um, thing have, and then we multiply that by the density of whatever's inside. Well, if we want to find, sorry, there we go. If we want to find the total mass of the entire thing, we need to take that and we need to add it up. And we need to add it up in three directions. So we need to add all of these rows times delta x, delta y, and delta z. <clears throat> of course, if we're going to integrate these things, then delta x, delta y, and z, we want to become very, very small. So, and I'm just going to write it in a different order. The order doesn't matter here. It's dz, dy, dx, and you're actually going to see that we're going to deal with orders in all different, all different ways of that. In order to add these things up, we are going to triple integral. And I'm going to go back up. We're going to do the triple integral over E. I'm going to go back up over here and show you why we're using a triple integral. The idea is that we're going to take all of the boxes, let's go with orange, all of the boxes in this direction, whatever those things are on that top upper row, and we're going to add those up. Okay, so we're going to find the density, excuse me, the mass of all those boxes and add them up. And then what we're going to do, so that's an integral in one direction because that's summing in one direction. That's technically your x direction. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take all the rows that we've created here on the top, all of these, and we're going to add all of those up in that direction. So first we went in this direction, or vice versa. I guess probably would have been best to go in the positive direction. So we're going to take all of the rows in the x direction, sorry, excuse me, all the boxes in the x direction, add them up. That's one integral. All the rows of boxes in the y direction, again, probably should have gone this way, add those up, and that's going to be the second integral. And then we're going to take all of these, I guess you would say, pallets. Looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six pallets, or six, um, six stacks of these rows, and then we're going to add them up in the z direction. So we're going to take all the pallets that we've created or all those stacks and add them up in the z direction. So that's why we are going to be able to find the um, mass of the entire box. Now, real quick, um, and then we'll get into some examples. If your density function is 1, well, that means all you're adding up is dz, dy, dx, which really means all you're doing is finding the volume. So if your density function or your row is 1, then really all you're adding is the change of x, change of y, and change of z. You're just finding the volume. But if your um, density function row is something else, then you are really finding the mass. OK, <clears throat> let's go ahead and do an example. So the first example. We are taking a triple integral of x plus yz dz dy dx. Okay, so just like before, you're going to take an antiderivative with the, with respect to the most inner um, variable, which in this case is z. So we're going to get xz plus one half y z squared, evaluated from zero to three. 
And then don't forget the other two pieces. Always got to bring those along until we're ready to use them. <clears throat> so let's see here. Recopying everything. So if we plug 3 in, again, we're plugging this in for Z. So we should get 3X. Um, so that's going to be Z squared. 3 squared is 9. So that's going to be plus 9 halves Y. And then you would plug in 0 for Z, but that's going to zero everything out. So then that's what we're going to get. And now we have to do the integral with respect to Y. So we're going to have the integral from 0 to 1. Now we're going to do this with respect to y, so that'll be 3xy, antiderivative there. That'll become y squared, so 9 fourths y squared. And we will evaluate that from 0 to 2. And then don't forget the dx on the end. All right, so let's plug the 2 in for y. Let's see, we're going to get 6x. Um, plus, let's see, that's going to be 2 squared, so it's going to be 9, because you'll get 9 fourths times 4, which is 9. And again, plugging in 0, zeros out the rest of them, so we're good there. So now all we have to do is take the antiderivative with respect to x, so we're going to get 3x squared plus 9x, and we'll evaluate that from 0 to 1. So we should just get 3 plus 9, which is 12. That was obviously a relatively simple example um, because all the things worked out to be very, very easy here. One thing I want to highlight, though, all of the bounds were constant. Unfortunately, you could not separate all the variables here because the x, is, x plus the yz part could not be separated. Otherwise, the same theorem from before would have held. We could have separated all three of them and then multiplied them together. We can't separate the variables through multiplication, so that doesn't work in this case. But all the bounds are constant, so if all the bounds are constant, we can change the order of integration without changing the function. <clears throat> the reason that's important is because there's going to be times where you might need to change the order of integration because it might be too difficult to integrate with respect to one variable before another one. So that's why that, that that's why that's important. Otherwise, wouldn't make any difference in this case which one you took did first. We could have done dy dx dz. We could have done dx dy dz. Any of the orders that you could possibly think of, and there's six different possible orders there. You could have done it as long as you um, also reverse the integration bounds. In other words. If you're going to make DC the outermost one, DZ the outermost one, then the 0 to 3 needs to be the outermost um, integral. All right, let's see. We've probably got time for one more. <clears throat> um, we'll see, maybe two. Example number two. Let's see, we've got 6XZ, DY, DX, DZ. All the bounds here are not constant, so we really can't change the order. <clears throat> so we pretty much just have to do this one in order. So antiderivative first with respect to y is just going to give you 6xyz. 6xyz. We'll have to evaluate that from 0 to x plus z. And then don't forget the other pieces. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. We are plugging x plus z in for y. So we're going to get 6xz times x plus z. And then if I plug 0 in for y, that zeroes out. So we're good there. Probably a good idea to go ahead and distribute 
<clears throat> before taking the antiderivative with respect to x. So we're going to get 6x squared z plus 6xz squared. And now I can take an, a relatively easy antiderivative there. With respect to x, that's going to be, let's see, that is going to be 2x cubed z plus 3x squared z squared. I believe that that is the correct antiderivative. We'll evaluate that from 0 to z. Yeah, that looks okay. And then, oops, nope, that should be a dz. And then integral 0 to 1. So let's see, plugging in z for x. That's going to give us 2z cubed times z, which is going to be 2z to the fourth. And then it's going to be plus 3z squared times z squared. That's also z to the fourth. So plus 3z to the fourth and dz integral 0 to 1. So, of course, that those two things can be combined. That's going to give me 5z to the fourth. So we'll have the integral from 0 to 1 of 5z to the fourth dz. This works out really nicely. Antiderivative there is just going to be z to the fifth from 0 to 1. Plugging in 1, you get 1. Plugging in 0, you get nothing. So after all that, the triple integral of that one is 1. Now, what was that? What does that one actually mean? Well, I've actually got a whatever this 6xz is. That's like my um, that's like my density function, and I'm doing that over some kind of a an e or a three dimensional, um, we'll say domain, I guess, a three dimensional region. Um, so the mass of the entire thing, whatever this is, is one. That's what we're finding there. All right, um, probably a good place to stop because the next one's going to take a little bit longer just because the, the numbers and stuff that you have to plug in and I have to show you a little bit. So we'll stop there. We'll come back with our second video. Again, this might be three video lesson. We'll have to see how the, how the next few go before we get to that.